Bosch was worried. The rehearsal the day before had gone well. Posing as Assistant Attorney General Hayden Morris, Mickey Haller had cross-examined him intensely, hitting him most harshly on his lack of experience in using cellular data in homicide investigations. Bosch had held up well by his own and Haller's estimation, and he'd thought he was ready for whatever Morris threw at him on Monday morning. But now, sitting on the witness stand and waiting for the judge to convene court, Bosch was worried because Morris was not alone at the AG's table. Next to him was a woman Bosch recognized as a former county prosecutor. She was good and tough and had been known in those days as Maggie McFleers. She was also Mickey Haller's ex-wife and the mother of his only child. Maggie McPherson had taken a leave of absence from the Ventura County District Attorney's Office to aid her ex-husband when he was wrongly accused of murder. Haller was eventually cleared and McPherson had gone back to Ventura, where she was in charge of the major crimes unit at the DA's office. But that intel was obviously old, as it was now clearer to Bosch that she worked for the AG. She was huddled with Morris at the opposing counsel's table in a whispered conversation. On the table in front of her was the thick stack of printouts of cell tower data Haller had turned over in discovery. Morris had pulled in a ringer. Bosch knew that McPherson would handle his cross-examination. Bosch looked over at the petitioner's table to see if Haller was exhibiting any concern or giving any indication of how he was going to play this. But Haller was preoccupied with the arrival of Lucinda Sands from the courtroom holding cell. When she was finally seated and shackled to the table ring by the marshals, Haller looked around the courtroom. He noticed a journalist he had told Bosch about, gave her a nod, and continued his scan. Bosch caught his eye. Haller made a hand gesture, a flat palm down, that told Bosch to stay calm. Bosch assumed that Haller was as surprised about Maggie McPherson's appearance as he was, but the Lincoln lawyer looked cool, calm, and collected. Bosch took his cue from that. Testifying in criminal cases was nothing new to Bosch. He had been in the witness box hundreds of times. When he had thought about it over the weekend, he realized that the first time he'd been called to testify was in a drug case in 1973. He had been in patrol then, a P1 stripe on the sleeve of his uniform. He had found an ounce of marijuana during the pat-down of a man loitering near Dorsey High School. All these years later, Bosch clearly remembered the suspect he had arrested. His legal name was Junior. Tidoro. He was 20 years old and a drill pop from Dorsey. The alert had gone out in that morning's roll call about a dealer setting up near the school. Bosch and his partner at the time had spotted Tidoro, did a stop and hop, so fast he couldn't run away, and caught him with the goods during the pat-down. Bosch's testimony came at a preliminary hearing on the case. After Tadoro was bound over for trial, he and his attorney negotiated a plea agreement. Bosch remembered it so well because Junior Tadoro pleaded, guilty, and got a term of five to seven years in prison for something that 50 years later was no longer a crime. Bosch had often considered how time changed something that was righteous back in the day into something far from it today. He thought about how that bust and the harsh sentence that followed had changed the course of Tadoro's life. When Bosch was still at the LEPD, he kept tabs on him through the California Law Enforcement tracking system, running his name from time to time. The prison gate became a revolving door for Tidoro. Whenever Bosch looked him up, he was either back in prison or recently released and on parole. Fifty years later, Bosch was still haunted by his part in setting Junior Tidoro on that path. And that was his worry now that his testimony under cross-examination might somehow contribute to Lucinda Sands losing her bid for freedom and that it would haunt him for the rest of his days. McPherson and Morris finished their whispered conference and McPherson reached down to a slim briefcase on the floor and withdrew a legal pad. She wrote a few notes on it and then placed it on top of the printouts, ready to take it all with her to the lectern. She glanced over at Bosch and caught him staring at her. Possibly sensing his alarm, she smiled. Of all his cases over the years, None had landed on her desk for prosecution, yet he knew she was a courtroom killer. So Bosch understood that her smile carried no warmth for him. It was the kind of smile a cat might offer a cornered mouse. There was finally a call to rise from the courtroom marshal and judge. Colbo took the bench. She noticed Bosch on the witness stand. Please be seated, she said. I see Detective Bosch is already in place. But before we begin cross-examination, we have some business to attend to. Rather than sitting down, Bosch turned to step out of the witness stand. That's all right, Detective Bosch, Colo said. This shouldn't take long. You may sit. Bosch sat down, 
noting that she had called him Detective Bosch. Mr. Morris, I see you have expanded your team today, Colo continued. Morris stood to address the court. Yes, Your Honor, he said. Assistant Attorney General Margaret McPherson will handle the cross-examination of Mr. Bosch. She has expertise in the matters she testified to last week. Well, that answers the question of whether there will be a cross-examination, the judge said. Mr. Haller, do you have anything you would like to bring to the attention of the court? Haller stood. Good morning, Your Honor, Haller said. As a matter of fact, I do. The petitioner objects to the addition of Ms. McPherson to the state's team as a conflict of interest. Morris stood back up. Just hold it right there, Mr. Morris, Colo said. What conflict is that, Mr. Haller? Miss McPherson and I were married at one time, Haller said. Bosch turned to check the judge's reaction. It was clear she had not known of the marital history of the two lawyers before her. Interesting, Colo said. I was not aware of that. When were you two married? It was quite a while ago, Your Honor, Haller said but there is an adult daughter and ongoing connections as well as ongoing upset over the dissolution of the marriage and its consequences. How so, Mr. Haller? The judge said. Your Honor, I believe Ms. McPherson harbors resentment over her career as a prosecutor for Los Angeles County being thwarted by her relationship with me. I would not want that to interfere with my client's ability to get a fair and impartial hearing on the facts of this petition. The judge turned her attention to Morris. Mr. Morris, are you attempting to inject outside conflict into this proceeding? Not at all, Your Honor, Morris said. As I already stated on the record, Ms. McPherson is the expert on cellular data in the California Attorney General's office. Last year, in fact, she was hired away from the Ventura County Prosecutor's Office because of her expertise in this field. This is an area of the law that is fairly new, and that comes up frequently as alleged. New evidence in appellate and abuse briefs. This material was sprung on us last week, and with the continuance the court granted, I took it to our expert, Ms. McPherson, who has been analyzing the material and preparing for this witness's cross-examination. There is no conflict, Your Honor. My understanding is that the marriage has been over for more years than it existed. There are no custody disputes because their one child is an adult and lives independently of her parents. There are no disputes at all, Judge. In fact, Two years ago, Ms. McPherson took a leave from the Ventura Prosecutor's Office to provide legal help to Mr. Haller when he was charged with a crime. Is all that true, Mr. Haller? Colo asked. It is true there are no custody or other legal disputes, Judge Haller said. But on more than one occasion, I was blamed for setbacks, demotions, and changes in Ms. McPherson's career. And, as I said earlier, I don't want any possible grudge to hinder Lucinda Sands's right to a fair and impartial hearing on the petition. The judge frowned and even Bosch knew why. It was the judge who needed to be fair and impartial. Haller's argument was misdirected. But before the judge could speak, Maggie McPhears did. Your Honor, may I be heard? She said. Everyone is talking about me. I think I should be allowed to respond. Go ahead, Ms. McPherson, Polo said. But be brief. This is not family court, and I don't want to turn it into an examination of a broken marriage, and what grievances may exist therein. I'm happy to be brief, McPherson said. The fact is, I hold no grudge against my ex-husband. It was indeed a complicated union between a prosecutor and a defense attorney. But it ended a long time ago. I have moved on, he has moved on, and our daughter is a grown woman making her way in the world. Mr. Morris did not even know of my marital history when he came to me last week and asked me to take a look at the material, turned over a discovery. It wasn't until I started working on it that I noticed that it was my ex-husband's case and that the witness was Mr. Bosch, whom I had met on occasion. I immediately informed Mr. Morris but told him, as I am telling the court, that Mr. Haller and I have no conflict of interest. Our relationship as the parents of a young woman is not conflicted in any way, and I hold no grudge against him, his client, or his witness. I am not sure that was brief, but the court appreciates counsel's honesty, Polo said. Anything else, Mr. Haller? Submitted, Haller said. Haller said it in a tone that dripped with defeat. He knew how this was going to go. Very well, the judge said. It is this court's responsibility to remain fair and impartial in hearing evidence and determining the truth of things. I intend to do that. The objection is overruled. Now, Mr. Haller, is there anything else you would like to bring up with the court before we proceed with the witness? Not at this time, Judge Haller said. 
Koval paused and looked at Haller. Bosch knew she was expecting him to announce that he had new discovery material to give to the AG. But there were no results yet from the DNA analysis begun the week before. This meant that Haller wouldn't know until he heard from Shami Arslanian, who was stationed at Applied Forensics monitoring the work, whether or not he had new evidence to help Lucinda Sands's case. Very well, the judge said again. Then let's proceed. Ms. McPherson, your witness. I called the Department of Corrections, Bosch said. With the help of an intel officer at Solid Ave, I was able to determine that the hit man and the transferred inmate Coldwell mentioned had never been in the same cell block and would not have crossed paths while they were both housed there. So that knocked that part of his story out. Then I talked to the mistress and she wasn't a good liar. Took me about 20 minutes to break her story. She admitted that Coldwell hadn't given her $25,000, that she had lied about it because he'd promised her money when he got out and sued the state for wrongful conviction and imprisonment. So that was it. We dropped the case, Mickey and I. So, Mr. Bosch, McPherson said, what you want the court to know is that you call them like you see them. I don't know if that was a question, but yes, I call them like I see them. Okay, well then, let's talk about the Sands case and how you saw it. Okay, Mr. Bosch? It's what I'm here for. Do you know what geofencing is, Mr. Bosch? Yes, it's kind of a fancy word for tracking the locations of cell phones through cellular data. It has become a useful tool for law enforcement, hasn't it? Yes. In your direct testimony, you said you have worked on hundreds of homicide cases, correct? Yes, correct. In how many of those cases did you use geofencing? None. It was a technology that really didn't come out until after I retired. Okay, then how many times have you used it as a private investigator? None. What about as a non-defense investigator working for Mr. Howler? This case was the first time. One case, would you say that makes you an expert on geofencing? An expert? I don't know what would make one an expert. I know how to read and map the data, if that's what you mean. How did you learn to read and map the data? I had some help from Mr. Howler, who was familiar with geofencing, from prior cases. But I learned the most when I studied the FBI's Internal Field Resource Guide for Agents in this area of investigation. It was put together by the Bureau's Cellular Analysis Survey Team and is basically a how to do it for agents. It's very detailed, over a hundred pages, and I read it twice before I started work on the data we received in this case. McPherson had not expected an answer that complete and quickly went to sarcasm to cover her error in asking the question. Simple as that, she said. Take an online course and you're an expert. It's not up to me to say whether I'm an expert, Bosch said, but it was the FBI's online course, if you want to call it that. It was designed so that any agent could trace and map the movement of cellular devices. If you're suggesting that I did it wrong or got it wrong, I would disagree. I think I got it right and it raises a lot of questions about Lucinda Sands's cult. Move to strike the witness's answer is non-responsive. McPherson looked up at the bench, but before the judge could respond. Howler stood. Non-responsive, he said. He didn't get the chance to finish his response. The judge wasn't interested in parrying with the lawyers. Let's just move on to the next question, Colo said. Continue, Ms. McPherson. Howler sat down. Bosch looked over at him for the first time during the cross. Howler nodded and did a small fist shake with his hand close to his chest. Bosch took it as a not-so-secret stay-strong gesture. Mr. Bosch, McPherson said, pulling Bosch's attention back. Are you ill? Howler jumped up from his seat. Your Honor, what is this? He said indignantly. Counsel has no business asking about the witness's health. What does it have to do with any question before this court? The judge cast a stern eye on McPherson. Miss McPherson, what are you doing here? She asked. Your Honor, McPherson said, if the court will indulge me, it will become quite clear what I'm doing and Mr. Howler is well aware of what I'm doing. The witness's health is an issue if it affects his work. You may proceed, the judge said, cautiously. Thank you, Your Honor, McPherson said, focusing again on the witness stand. She asked, Mr. Bosch, are you presently being treated for a medical condition? No, Bosch said. McPherson looked surprised but quickly covered it. Then have you recently been treated for a medical condition? She asked. Bosch hesitated as he thought about how to phrase his answer. I was being treated earlier this year, he finally said. Treated for what? McPherson said. 
Haller, apparently sensing where this could go, stood again to object. Your Honor, last week my asking a witness for her cell number had Mr. Morris jumping out of his shoes, he said. But now it's okay to drag a witness's personal medical history into the case. Aren't there limits to invasion of privacy in this court? Mr. Haller makes a good point, Ms. McPherson Polo said. Your Honor, the witness's medical status is important to this case, and I can demonstrate why if I am allowed to continue, McPherson said. Mr. Haller knows this, and that is why he is jumping out of his shoes. Make it fast, Ms. McPherson, the judge said. My patience is wearing thin. Haller sat down and the judge told Bosch she must answer the question. I was being treated for cancer, Bosch said. I was part of a clinical trial that ended almost six months ago. And was the treatment successful? McPherson asked. The doctors seemed to think so. They said I'm in partial remission. And this clinical trial was it to test a drug therapy? Yes. Using what drug? It was an isotope, actually. I believe it is called lutetium 17 You were being treated with this isotope while you worked on this case. Yes, it was just one morning a week for 12 weeks. And what are the possible side effects associated with lutetium 77? Oh, well, there's nausea, tinnitus, exhaustion. There's a whole list, but other than those I just mentioned, I didn't really have any side effects. What about confusion and memory loss? Ah, I think those were on the list, but I haven't experienced them. Have you experienced any cognitive impairment while working on this case? Howler stood, arms out in an imploring gesture. Your Honor, really? The judge pointed to his empty chair. Your objection has been overruled, she said. Sit down, Mr. Howler. Howler slowly sat down. Do you need me to repeat the question? McPherson asked. No, Bosch said. I can remember. Thank you. The answer is no, I have not experienced any cognitive impairment. Have you asked the doctor about it or taken a cognitive test in the past six months? No, I have not. McPherson looked down at a document she had carried with her to the lectern. Earlier this year, did you report a break-in at your home? She asked. Oh, yes, I did, Bosch said. And was this while you were being treated with the isotope lutetium? 177. Yes. McPherson asked the judge to allow her to approach the witness with a document she called State's Exhibit 1. First, McPherson dropped off copies to Haller and the judge. Bosch watched Haller read it and noticed alarm come into his eyes. He stood and objected, stating the document had not been submitted to him through discovery. Offered as impeachment, Your Honor, McPherson said, the witness just testified to having no cognitive issues. Yes, I'll allow it. Colo said. Bosch braced himself as McPherson came with him with a copy of the document and then returned to the lectern. Mr. Bosch, is that the police report from the alleged break-in at your home on Woodrow Wilson Drive? She asked. Oh, it looks like it, Bosch said. That's my address. But I have not seen this before. Well, you are a police officer. Does it look official to you? Yes. Then could you read the paragraph in the responding officer's summary that I have highlighted in yellow? I guess, it says, upon questioning, victim seemed confused and unsure if a break-in had occurred. Victim is ill and being treated. Possible, dementia. Walk through a residence conducted. No evidence of burglary. No further follow-up is required. Bosch felt his neck and back start to burn. He was stunned by what the responding officer had written. I wasn't confused, he said. Because nothing was taken, I wasn't sure. There had been a break-in. That's all and dementia was his word, not, Your Honor, moved to strike the witness's last comment as non-responsive, McPherson said. So moved, Colo said. Do you have any other questions, Ms. McPherson? No, Your Honor. She moved from the lectern and sat down next to Morris. A silence engulfed the courtroom and Bosch noticed that no one was looking at him, not even Haller. It was like everyone was embarrassed for him. He wanted to shout, I have not lost my mind but he knew that would support Maggie McPherson's implication. Mr. Haller, the judge finally said, redirect. Haller stood and slowly moved to the lectern. Thank you, judge, he said. Mr. Bosch, during the course of this investigation, how many times have you gone out to the state prison in China to visit our client, Lucinda Sands? Bosch looked up from the police report that was still in front of him. Four times, he said. Once with you, three times by myself. That's about an hour out, correct? 
Yes. Do you use one of the GPS apps to find your way out there? Oh, no. No. I know where it is. So you've never gotten lost or taken the freeway too far and gone past your exit? No. You drive me often while we are working, correct? Yes. I don't think I've ever seen you use a GPS app. Why is that? I don't use them. I know where I'm going. Thank you. I have nothing further. I asked for the morning break as soon as Bosch was excused from the witness stand. The judge gave us 15 minutes. Maggie McPhears grabbed her thin leather briefcase and was out of the courtroom and gone before I could get to her. It didn't matter, because I was more concerned about Bosch. I met him at the railing. Don't say anything here, I said. Let's go out and grab a conference room. We excited the courtroom. The hall was empty. No sign of Maggie. We walked to an attorney meeting room that was one courtroom down, a small space with a table and chairs and four windowless walls. I felt claustrophobic as soon as we walked in. Sit down, I said. Harry, I don't know what you're thinking, but let it go. The cop who wrote that report was full of shit, and so are Maggie and Morris. Fuck them. How did she know about UCLA? Bosch said, that could not possibly be discovery stuff. She. I'm sorry, Nan. That's on me. Last time we had dinner together with Haley, I mentioned that you were working for me and then I'd gotten you into that trial. It was before she even took the job with the AG. I can't believe she used it. I'm sorry, Harry. Bosch shook his head. Well, he said, how mad does it hurt us? I don't know, I said. I think the judge could see that you don't have any kind of problem. The whole thing is bullshit. And what it shows is that their so-called geofencing expert had to resort to character assassination because she could find nothing wrong with your direct testimony about geofencing. That's not going to be lost on the judge. I took out my phone, turned it on, and waited for it to boot up. It's always been the defense lawyers who pulled that kill the messenger sort of shit, Bosch said, not the DA, not the AG. It was low, I said, and I'm going to make sure she knows it. Don't bother. It's over. Have we heard anything from Applied Forensics? Shami's over there. Last I heard they're still working on it. I opened up a text to Maggie and started typing. Now I know why you didn't invite Haley to watch us in court. That was low, Mags. How would you do that? I reread what I had typed and then sent it. I checked my watch. We needed to get back into the courtroom in five minutes. Okay, are you good? I asked. I'm fine, Bosch said. But I don't think my saying I don't get lost while driving is going to be enough to fix the damage. It's the best I could come up with on the spot, but it's not just about that. You testified thoroughly and professionally last week. You were in complete command of the cell tower data and the judge saw and heard that. She won't make any decision based on what just happened. I think we're fine. What I need now is for you to go find Frank Silver and bring him in. We're going to need him to testify if and when we get the results from Shami. What about Sanger? She's last, after we have the DNA. And Messesick. No Messesick. I'm not going that route. What? I thought this whole thing was to get the judge to. All of that's changed. We'll never get Messesick on the stand, so we go without him. How do you know she won't order him to testify? Because he paid me a visit last night. What? After dinner? When I got home, he was sitting on my porch. He's working undercover on a national security thing, and they're not going to let him near the courthouse. Bullshit. They use that national security crap any time they don't want to. I believed him. Why? Because he gave me something. Something I can use against Sanger. What? I can't say at the moment. I have to figure a few things out, and then I'll tell you. Bosch looked at me as though I had just said I didn't trust him. Look, I'll run you to the loop as soon as I can. I need to get back to court now, and you need to find second place silver. Bosch nodded. Okay, he said. He got up and turned to the door. And I'm sorry, Harry, I said, about what Maggie pulled in there. It's not on you, Mick, he said. I'll let you know when I have silver ready to go. In the hall, he went one way and I went the other, toward the courtroom. Before I got there, Maggie hit me back with a text. A lawyer once said that all was fair on the proving ground of the courtroom. Oh yeah, I think that lawyer was you. I decided not to respond. Instead, I called Shami Arslanian. Where are we? I asked. We just got results, she said. I'm looking at them now. I braced myself. 
This was the case. And, I prompted. There was DNA on the swab, she said. It's not Lucinda's. I suddenly, almost involuntarily, moved to one of the marble benches, lining the hall, and sat down, the phone pressed against my ear. In that moment, I felt that we would win, that Lucinda Sands would walk free. Mickey, are you there? Arslanian said. Oh, yeah, I said. I'm just, this is incredible. There is a complication. What's that? The DNA that's there comes from two other people. One is unknown. But we already matched the other because it belongs to a former lab tech at Applied Forensics. They'd always run matching to their own personnel to guard against contamination. What does this mean, Shami? The lab tech it matches has not worked here in four years. It means that at some point when the evidence was brought here, it got mishandled and contaminated with his DNA. Again, we're talking about touch DNA, which at the time they didn't have a protocol for. I closed my eyes. Jesus Christ. Every time I think we'd grab the brass ring, something goes wrong and we got shit. I'm sorry, Mickey, but the important thing is that Lucinda's DNA is not on the GSR pad. This proves your theory of the crime. Are you saying you won't be able to use this in court? I don't know. I really don't know. But I need you to be back to the courthouse as soon as you can with whatever reports you have there. It's the name of the tech from before and whatever documentation there is about the contamination. You'll probably have to explain everything in an evidentiary hearing before the judge. I'm going to go ask for that now. Okay, Mickey, I'll grab a neighbor. I disconnected and tried to compose myself, channeling the ghost of Legal Siegel. Breathe it in. This is your moment. This is your stage. Want it? Own it. Take it. I got up off the bench and re-entered the courtroom. O-E-U-R-M-Y-O-B-G-E-C-T-I-O-N, Judge Colho held the evidentiary hearing, behind closed doors. The Latin term for it was in camera, which sounded like the opposite of a private meeting. I had opposed it because if the judge ruled against the introduction of the DNA findings, I wanted the world to know it and shared my outrage. But my argument for an open hearing fell on deaf ears, and I found myself sitting next to Hayden Morris in front of Colho and her massive desk in chambers. My client was deemed unnecessary to the hearing and was waiting in the courtside lockup for me to tell her how things shook out. Before we begin, we need to inform Mr. Morris of what has transpired over the past five days, Colo said. Last Wednesday, Mr. Haller came to me and informed me that evidence from the earlier adjudicated case had been located. He asked for sealed orders that would allow him to pursue the testing of this evidence. What was the evidence? Morris asked. And what tests are we talking about? It gets complicated, Mr. Morris, the judge said. I'll let Mr. Haller explain the details. She nodded to me and I took up the story. Yes, Your Honor, I said. During the initial prosecution of the case five years ago, defense counsel, a lawyer named Frank Silver, asked for a split of evidence so he could conduct independent testing. There were two gunshot residue pads presumably used to swipe Lucinda Sands's hands, arms, and clothing. As you know, GSR was a key piece of the prosecution's case. The court gave him one of the two pads to have independently tested for gunshot residue. This was before the plea agreement. Morris asked. Exactly, I said. The pad was transferred to Applied Forensics, an independent lab out in Van Nuys that still operates today. While that was happening, plea negotiations began, and as we all know, Lucinda Sands took the plea deal. She went off to prison after pleading Nolo, and Silver never bothered going back to Applied Forensics to retrieve the evidence. We'd have learned of this Wednesday, checked it out, and the evidence was still in storage at the lab largely because Silver never paid the lab's bill. You've got to be kidding me, Morris said, shaking his head. This sounds like a setup if I've ever heard one. Your Honor, why are we even considering this? Let Mr. Haller continue, Polo said. Think what you want, I said. But I came to the judge Wednesday and asked for orders to have the remaining pad tested for DNA, because if the pad was actually swiped over my client's hands and clothes, we would find her DNA, her touch DNA on the pad. I have a forensics expert who backs me up on this. The judge then ordered the U.S. Marshals to swab Sands and take her DNA sample to applied forensics. I don't care who backs you up, Morris said. This is incredibly unusual and the wrong protocol. This should have been handled by either the sheriff's lab or the state DOJ's crime lab, not some fly-by-night lab in the valley. 
He said it in a tone that suggested all of the San Fernando Valley was a haven for fly-by-night businesses and people. Mr. Howler asked me to seal the orders, the judge said. He wanted the evidence analyzed privately because of his concerns over obstruction from within the government agencies. I agreed. The orders were sealed until there were results. If this goes any further, you will have the opportunity to test the evidence at the lab of your choice, Mr. Morris. Now, Mr. Haller, I assume you called for this session because you have results. Yes, Your Honor, I said. The lab results are in. The GSR pad did contain gunshot residue. Two unique DNA profiles were also identified and compared to my client's profile. There was no match. That pad was never swiped over my client's body, and this is proof that she was framed for her ex-husband's murder. It's proof of nothing, Morris said. This is incredible. The court has been manipulated by this, this grand master of smoke. Your Honor, this evidence, if you want to call it that, is clearly not admissible. I believe that is a decision for the court to make, Mr. Morris, the judge said. And perhaps you would like to explain how the court has been manipulated. I'm sure Mr. Haller has witnesses and documentation of every step of this process over the past five days. I'm sure his forensics expert, whom we have already heard testimony from, is standing by to render her expert opinion that a pad wiped over a person's body and clothing would have to pick up that person's DNA. Where is the manipulation of the court? Your Honor, I'm sorry if I impugned the integrity of the court, Morris said quickly. That was not my intention. But this story is too far-fetched. It's eleventh-hour pyrotechnics by counsel designed to distract the court from the evidence of direct culpability that has always been there. If it is eleventh-hour pyrotechnics, I'm sure the state's lab will bring it to light, Cuomo said, annoyance in her voice. There is also a bit of a complication, I said. Cuomo turned her annoyance in my direction. What complication, she said. As I said, there were two unique DNA profiles found on the GSR pad. I said, one remains unidentified, the other has been identified as a lab tech who previously worked at Applied Forensics. Morris threw his hands up in exasperation. Then the whole thing's tainted, he said. It's inadmissible, no question. Again, there is a question and it's for the court to decide, Colo said. I would argue that it's not tainted, I said. The evidence was submitted for GSR analysis and was handled by the lab tech according to that protocol, not DNA protocol. Not touch DNA protocol. Five years ago, there were very few labs that even had protocols for touch DNA. But that was not the purpose of Frank Silver's original submission. Doesn't matter, Morris said. It's tainted. It doesn't come in. Inadmissible, Your Honor. I looked at the judge. My argument had been directed toward her, not Morris, but I didn't want her to make a ruling yet. Your Honor, I said, I would like to make a motion to the court. Morris rolled his eyes. Here we go, he said. Mr. Morris, I've grown weird your sarcasm, Colho said. What is your motion, Mr. Haller? I leaned forward over the edge of her desk, shortening the distance between us and cutting Morris out of my peripheral vision. This was between me and the judge. Judge, if we want the truth, if this is truly a search for the truth, the court should issue an order to have the unidentified DNA found on the GSR pad compared to DNA swab from Sergeant Sanger. No way, barked Morris. That is not happening. And it would prove nothing anyway. So what if Sanger's DNA is on it? She's on record as having collected the evidence. It proves the setup, I said. That she turned over dirty GSR pads that were never wiped over Sansa's hands. It's proof of Sansa's innocence and proof that Sanger is guilty as sin. Your Honor, Morris said, you can't. I'm going to stop you there, Mr. Morris, the judge said. This is what we're going to do. I'll take Mr. Howler's motion as well as the question of admissibility under advisement, and will issue my decisions after some research and deliberation. I frowned. I wanted her to rule on everything right now. Judges and juries were the same. The longer they took to decide, the more likely the outcome would be adverse to the defense. We're going to take our lunch break now and we'll reconvene court at one o'clock, the judge continued. Mr. Howler, have your next witness. Ready to go then. Your Honor, I can't put my next witness on, I said. And why is that? Cuomo asked. Because I won't know whom to put on until I know your rulings on these matters, I said. They will dictate my next move. Cuomo nodded. Very well, she said. Let's push the afternoon session until two o'clock, 
and you will have my rulings on these matters then. Thank you, Judge, I said. Thank you, Your Honor, Morris said. You can leave now, gentlemen, the judge said. I have work to do. Would you ask Jean to come back here to give my lunch order? I won't have time to leave chambers. Yes, Judge, I said. Morris and I stood up in unison, and I followed him out. Once in the hall, I spoke to his back. I don't know how this is going to shake out, I said. But just so I'm ready for anything, I have Sergeant Sanger back at the courthouse at two. Not my job, man, he said. She's your witness. And she works for you and takes calls from you. Have her there or I'd tell the judge I told you I was recalling her and he refused to cooperate. You can explain it to her then. Fine. When we got to the door to the courtroom, he looked cautiously over his shoulder at me. But I made no move to pin him against the wall as I had done before. And he made no comment that spurred me to do so. But the moment it made me realize something. I reached forward and put my hand on the door, preventing him from opening it. What are you doing? he said. Aren't you going to attack me again? You knew, didn't you? I said. Knew what? About my ex-wife. You brought her in here to stir things up. Knock me off my game because you knew about us? I don't know what you're talking about. I had no idea you two had been married. Yes, you did. You knew. Who's the grand master of smoke now? Morris. I took my hand off the door and he opened it and went through without another word to me. Team Sands had a long working lunch at Drago Centro during which I reported on the in-camera hearing and we planned the end game of the case, which would depend on how the judge ruled. If the lab results were admitted, the strategy was obvious. I knew Silver and Arslanian to introduce the timeline and evidence, and then I'd bring it all home by calling. Sanger back to the stand and confronting her with solid evidence that the GSR pads she had turned in had not been wiped over Lucinda Sands's hands. But if Colho ruled the lab results inadmissible, I was left with only Sanger and not a lot to back up any sort of confrontational examination. Agent, Miss Isaac had given me a tip, but it was nothing more than innuendo. Sanger might be able to bat it away like it was a fly buzzing around her face. If you were betting, which way do you think she'll go? Bosch asked at one point. First of all, I wouldn't bet, I said. It's too close to call. It's going to come down to whether she makes the legal call or the moral call. What does the law tell her to do? What does her gut tell her is the right thing to do? Shit, Cisco said. Then you'll have nothing to go after Sanger with. Game over. Maybe not, I said. I had a visitor to my house last night, Agent Masaisik. He was there to let me know that he would never testify in this case and the U.S. attorney was ready to back him on that and even defied a subpoena from a federal judge. But he didn't come empty-handed. He told me why Roberto Sands had gone to the bureau and volunteered to wear a wire. It was not Sanger. I gave the intel that Mess Isaac had given me and we spent the rest of the meal brainstorming ways of getting it into court. It was clear it would come, down to my questioning of Sanger and finding the opportunity to confront her. Easier said than done. After our pasta, we bundled into the navigator, and Bosch took us back to the courthouse. As we came out of the elevator and approached Colho's courtroom, I saw a Sergeant Sanger waiting on a bench in the hall. She stared unflinchingly at me as we passed by, as if daring me to challenge her. I knew then that, one way or the other, I would do everything I could to take her down after the judge made her rulings. I sat at the petitioner's table and waited for Lucinda to be brought to the courtroom and for the judge to follow. I didn't unpack my briefcase. I wanted to know which way I was going first. I looked up at the angry eagle, composed myself, and waited. The questions came fast and furious from Lucinda once she was brought from lockup to the table. Mickey, what's going on? she asked. I didn't know what was happening and I was waiting so long in there. I'm sorry about that, Cindy, I said. We're going to get answers very soon. We went into the judge's office and I presented evidence that showed that the gunshot residue test was wrong. Was the setup actually? Who set me up? Somebody in your ex-husband's unit. Probably Sanger, since she's the one who did the test on you. Does that mean she killed Robbie? I don't know that, Cindy, but put it this way. If I need to convince the judge that it was somebody other than you, I'm going to point at her. She's smack dab in the middle of this. And if it wasn't her, then she knows who it was. Lucinda's face grew dark with anger. She had served five years for somebody else's crime, and now she might have a name and face to focus, that anger and blame on. I understood her. But listen, I said, there are complications with the evidence we uncovered, 
and we have to see if the judge is going to let it be part of what she considers. That's why everything's been delayed. The judge has been back there in chambers working on it. Okay, Lucinda said, I hope she does the right thing. Me too. I went quiet and thought about how I would react to each of the judge's possible rulings. This led me to a plan I thought might help me salvage the case should the ruling not go my way. I quickly fired off a series of texts with instructions to Harry Bosch and Shamit Arslanian. Bosch was in the hall watching Frank Silver in case he decided to hightail it before testifying. Arslanian was out there too, waiting to see if she would be called back to the witness stand. Before Bosch responded to confirm that he understood my plan, the judge emerged from chambers and I had to turn off the phone. Colvo got right down to business. All right, back on the record with Sands versus the state of California. She said, continuing the Habeas hearing, Gentlemen, is there any new business to discuss before I make rulings on the motions before the court? I half expected Morris to try to continue the arguments he'd made in chambers, though it was pretty clear the judge was past all that and ready to rule. But Morris declined to add anything to the record, and I had nothing to add either. I looked at Lucinda and gave her an encouraging smile, but she didn't know how important the next few minutes would be. Very well, the judge said, in regard to the motions brought before the court this morning, let's start with the state's contention that the evidence is inadmissible because of contamination and mishandling by the lab that conducted analysis of the gunshot residue pad submitted by the defense. The fact pattern shows that the contamination by a lab tech occurred several years ago when the evidence was submitted under different circumstances and protocols. The contamination did not occur during the most recent analysis conducted. It also should be noted that the text DNA exemplar was available for comparison, as it is standard practice in certified DNA labs to check findings for contamination by lab personnel. I could tell that Morris' contamination argument was not going to carry the day. The judge was going to shoot it down. I began to get the stirrings of hope and excitement. I believe that what is most important here is not whose DNA was found on the evidence but whose wasn't, Colo said. The petitioner's DNA was not found on the evidence and that is as troubling to the court as it is exculpatory to the petitioner. I looked at Lucinda. It was clear she could not follow the legalese, threaded through the judge's words, but I gave her a half-smile of reassurance. So far, this was going our way. Something was wrong about this case and the investigation from the very start, the judge continued. And it is the court's hope that a proper investigation of the investigation will follow these proceedings. However, the court is also troubled by the petitioner's defense in regard to the original charges against her. And now I felt it. The other shoe was going to drop. The judge was not going to allow the evidence into her ultimate decision on the petition. The foundation of the habeas corpus motion is to bring forth new evidence that proves the unlawful detention of the petitioner. Colo said, I'm sorry to say, this evidence is not new. It has been sitting undisturbed in a lab for five years, and it clearly could have been accessed and tested for the petitioner's DNA from the very beginning of the prosecution of the case. The claim by the petitioner that touch DNA was unavailable at that time is not correct. There are notable criminal cases involving the use of touch DNA much earlier than this, including the Casey Anthony case in Florida and the John Bennett Ramsey investigation in Colorado. So the court must decide whether this evidence is new or if it was available to be pursued and analyzed five years ago before the petitioner's plea of Nolo contender to the crime. I couldn't believe this. I lowered my head, I could not even turn to look at my client. The court finds the latter, Colo said, this evidence could have, possibly should have been pursued by the defense five years ago, and is therefore excluded from these proceedings. The petitioner may very well be left with a valid claim of ineffective assistance of counsel regarding the initial pleading of this case, but that is not part of this motion and hearing. I shot up out of my seat. Your Honor, those cases you mentioned are outliers, I said. They were massive investigations that took time and money. This science wasn't used in more ordinary cases. The original attorney on this was ineffective, yes, but not in this regard. No one was using it then. But someone could have, Mr. Haller, Colo said, and that's the point. No, you're not doing this. The judge looked at me for a moment, stunned by my outburst. Excuse me, Mr. Haller, she finally said. You can't do this, I said. I just did, Mr. Haller, and you need to. It's wrong. I object. It is proof of innocence, judge. You can't just throw it away because it doesn't fit with the rule of law. 
the judge paused, then continued in an even tone. Mr. Haller, be careful, she warned. The ruling has been made. If you think it is an error, then there are remedies you can pursue. But don't you dare challenge me here. If you have another witness, then call that person to the stand and we will proceed. No, I won't, I said. This is a sham. You killed the recreation, and now you kill this. My client is innocent, and at every turn you have disallowed the evidence that proves it. The judge paused for a moment, but her anger toward me did not abate. It seemed to boil up into her eyes. She stared daggers at me. Are you quite finished, Mr. Haller? No, I said. I object. The evidence is new. It's not five years old. It was determined in a lab this morning. How can you claim it's not new and send this woman, the mother of a young boy? back to prison for a crime she didn't commit. Mr. Haller, I will give you one chance to sit down and close your mouth, Colo said. You are dangerously close to being in contempt of this court. I'm sorry, Your Honor, but I won't be muzzled, I said. I must speak the truth because this court will not. You kicked out the crime recreation. And that's okay, I can live with that. But the DNA, the DNA proves that my client was set up for this murder. How can you sit there and say it's inadmissible? In any other court in this country, it would be proof of, Mr. Haller. The judge yelled, I warned you. I find you in contempt of this court. Marshal, take Mr. Haller into custody. This is a federal court, Mr. Haller. Talking back to the court and insulting its rulings might work for you in state court, but not here. You can't shut me up. I yelled. This is wrong and everyone in this place knows it. I was pushed forward by Marshal Nate and bent over the table. My arms were roughly pulled behind my back and my wrists cuffed tightly. A hand gripped the back of my collar and I was pulled into a standing position. The Marshal then turned me and shoved me toward the door to courtside lockup. Perhaps a night in jail will teach you to respect the court, Colvo called after me. Lucinda Sands is innocent. I yelled as I was pushed through the door. You know it, I know it, everybody in the courtroom knows it. The last thing I heard before the door was shut was Colvo adjourning. Court for the day. It was just what I'd hoped would happen. Bosch was driving the navigator, Arslanian in the passenger seat, next to him. They were moving in slow traffic on the northbound 101 freeway. Do you think she'll hold him overnight? Arslanian asked. Sounds like it, Bosch said. Sounds like he really made her blow a gasket. Sort of wish I'd been in the courtroom for it. Do you think he'll be in danger in there? They'll likely isolate him. The last thing the judge wants is for a lawyer. She's stuck in there to get hurt. Well, will he be kept in the court holding cell all night? No, they'll take him to MDC. What's MDC? Metropolitan Detention Center. It's the federal jail. They don't keep any overnighters in the courthouse jail. Everybody is buzzed back to MDC at the end of the day. He's probably on a bus now or the marshals might move him solo because of his VIP status. I hope so. He'll be all right. I'm sure he factored it all in before he went nuts with the judge. When he got accused of murder a few years ago, he spent three months in county and managed to stay safe. You heard about that, right? Oh yes, I was ready to come out if needed but then you and the others on the team got it done. Yeah, including Maggie McPhears, who tore me up pretty good on the stand today. You know, I considered becoming a lawyer, maybe adding a law degree to the others. But then I thought, nah, too many gray areas and shifting loyalties. I'll stick with the science side of things. Good plan. Anyway, I just can't believe the judge's ruling on the science. Bosch didn't reply. It had been as Haller had said at lunch. The judge chose to go by the book, not by what was right. No gray area there. She's exiting, he said. Arslanian looked through the windshield. Bosch switched lanes so he could follow the car they were tailing. Where do you think she's going? Arslanian asked. No idea, Bosch said. I don't think she lives this far from the AV. Sanger was driving a Rivian pickup truck. There were so few of these on the road that it was an easy follow, allowing Bosch to fall far back and not be noticed. But as he went down the Venture Boulevard exit, he realized he was going to end up only two cars behind her at the traffic light. If Sanger checked her mirrors, she might recognize the navigator and the two people in it. It was a two-lane turn. The Rivian was in the inside lane with another pickup truck behind it. Bosch stopped behind the second pickup 
and lowered his sun visor. The bed of the truck in front of him had a pipe rack and other air conditioning maintenance equipment that worked well as a blind. A homeless man stood on his shoulder with a sign asking for help in any form. When nothing came from the Rivian, he started walking down the shoulder, holding up his hand-lettered cardboard sign. The light stayed red. From his vantage point, Bosch could see the side of the truck in front of him as well as Sanger's truck. He saw the driver's side window of the Rivian go down. He saw cigarette smoke escape as Sanger extended her hand and arm out the window and threw something onto the shoulder by the homeless man's backpack and plastic milk crate. She just threw something out the window, he said. I think it was a cigarette butt. That'll work, right? Yes. Arslanian said, definitely. Do you see it? I think so. Let's get it. We'll probably lose her if we stop. It's okay. A cigarette is all we need. We go straight to the lab with it. The light turned green and the Rivian took off, went left across the overpass, and down to Ventura. Bosch checked his rear view and saw that he now had two cars behind him. He hit the emergency blinkers and pulled the navigator onto the shoulder as far as he could, but there wasn't enough room for him to get completely out of the traffic lane and still have space to open his door and hit out. A chorus of horns followed this move. Undaunted, Bosch put the vehicle in park, got out, and found the homeless man standing in the thin channel between the navigator and a concrete retaining wall that lined the exit ramp. Hey, what the fuck? The man said. You almost hit me. Sorry about that, Bosch said. He closed the car door and walked to the spot by the milk crate, pulling out his phone as he approached. He crouched at the spot, his knees sending stress signals to his brain. He surveyed the area and saw the cigarette butt on the loose gravel. He opened his camera app and took a photo of the cigarette butt in situ, as it had been found, just in case the evidence collection was challenged in any way. He put the phone away and pulled a Ziploc bag out of his coat pocket. Using the bag as a glove, he picked up the discarded butt and sealed it inside. He got up, turned, and headed back to the navigator. The homeless man was still standing there, a puzzled look on his face. Hey, man, that cigarette is mine, he said. This is my spot. I own it. It's just a butt, Bosch said. She smoked it down to the filter. Doesn't matter. It's mine. You want to buy it. How much? Ten dollars. For a cigarette butt? Ten dollars, man. That's the price. Bosch reached into his pocket and pulled out his money. He had a twenty and a ten. He held the ten out to the man. Do you mind stepping back so I can get back in the car? Bosch said. Sure thing, boss. He grabbed the ten and backed away. Bosch got in the navigator and closed the door. He handed the Ziploc to Arslanian as he checked the rear view to see if it was cleared to enter the traffic lane. She examined the contents of the bag without opening it. This is going to be perfect, she said. We got lucky. About time, Bosch said. I thought we'd be following her all the way to the Antelope Valley and then to some. Then have to look through her trash. Me too. So applied forensics? Absolutely. I'll call ahead so they're ready for us. If we need this in now, we could have what we need by tomorrow. The light turned green and Bosch muscled the navigator into the traffic lane in front of a car garnering another angry horn rebuke from the driver. Bosch held his hand up, waved his thanks, and drove on. As they headed toward Van News, Bosch put things together. She broke into my house, he said. Who did? Arslanian asked. Sanger. When was this? Like seven months ago. I wasn't sure till now. I smelled cigarette smoke when I came home and found the place open. Did she take anything? No, she just wanted me to know. It was an intimidation tactic. Bosch smiled and shook his head. But it didn't work, because I wasn't sure if I had left the door open and was just losing my mind, he said. You know, like dementia or something. I thought the cigarette smell might have been a side effect from the isotope they were putting in me. Then I guess it must be nice to know there really was a break-in, which sounds weird said out loud. Yeah, I guess you're right. Bosch thought about the police report that Maggie McPhears had used to embarrass him in court and suggest he was losing his mind. He now felt vindicated. In the morning, the marshals moved me back to the federal courthouse on the 7 o'clock jail bus. I then spent the next two hours in the main courthouse jail with other detainees awaiting transfer to specific courtrooms and their holding cells. I was wearing federal blues and was unsure what had happened to my clothes, wallet, and phone. 
I was eventually moved to the cell off Judge Coho's courtroom. Lucinda Sands was already in the cell, next to mine. We couldn't see each other, but we could hear each other. Mickey, are you okay? She whispered. I'm fine, I said. How are you feeling, Cindy? I'm good. I can't believe they made you stay the whole night. The judge wanted to make a point. Marshal Nate came into the holding area, unlocked my cell, and handed me a brown paper bag. Your clothes, he said. Get dressed. The judge wants to see you. I dug through the bag. My suit was crumpled into a ball on top of my shoes. Where's my phone? I said, and my wallet and keys. Locked in my desk, Nate said. You get it back when the judge tells me to give it back. You got five minutes. Get dressed. No, I'm not getting dressed in this stuff. The suit's wrinkled. If you're going to take me to see the judge, I'll go like this. Suit yourself, no pun intended. Good one, Nate. Do I need to put the belly chain and cuffs back on or are you going to behave? No need. He walked me out of the cell and passed Lucinda's on the way to the courtroom door. Hang in there, Lucinda, I said. I was walked through the courtroom, which was dark except for the single light over Jen Brown's coral. All right to take him back? Nate asked. She's waiting for him, Brown said. He gave me and my attire the once over. Are you sure you don't want to change into your clothes? Brown asked. I'm sure, I said. The marshal opened the half door to the coral, and we walked through to the hall that led to the judge's chambers. Nate knocked on the judge's door, and we heard her call to enter. Nate walked me in and sat me down in one of the chairs in front of the desk. Judge Colho sat on the other side of it. I gave instructions to put you back in your suit, Mr. Haller, she said. The suit's toast, I said. It's a canale, Italian silk that's been balled up in a paper bag overnight. I need my phone so I can get a fresh suit delivered. We'll get you your phone. Nate, please have that ready for Mr. Howler. When we're through here, you can go back to the courtroom now. Marshal Nate looked hesitant. Are you sure I shouldn't stay, Judge? He asked. I'm sure I will be fine, Colo said. I'll call when it's time to retrieve. Mr. Howler, you can go now. Marshal Nate left the room and closed the door behind him. The judge looked at me for a moment, assessing me and determining what to say. I'm sorry it came to this, Mr. Howler, she said. But the disrespect you showed the court yesterday could not be allowed to stand. It is my hope that you use the night to reflect on how you handled yourself in my courtroom, and that you can assure me it won't happen again. I nodded. I reflected on a lot of things, Judge, I said. I apologize for my words and actions. I am contrite. It won't happen again, I promise you. The only thing I had resolved during my overnight in the cold solo so was never to address Colho as your honor again. Very well, Colho said. Apology accepted. You are released from contempt, and perhaps we can get a rush on your suit so that we don't lose the entire morning. I will tell all parties to be in court by eleven to proceed. Thank you, I said. I'd like to get out of this outfit as soon as possible. I just buzzed you in, and Nate will have your property out there. When you put out the word about resuming the hearing, can you make sure that Surgeon Sanger is on notice to return to court? She'll most likely be my next witness. I will order her return. Five minutes later, I was sitting in the courtroom, taking my phone out of a plastic property bag. The first call I made was to Bosch. Mick, you're sprung? Yeah, just now. What's happening? Where are you? We're at applied forensics. We brought in a cigarette butt from Sanger, and fifteen minutes ago, Shami said they need two more hours. Okay, I can deal with that. As soon as you know something, text me. You got it. I disconnected and then called Lorna Taylor. Oh my God, Mickey, are you all right? I am now. Where are you? In the courtroom. I need you to give me a suit, shirt, and tie and bring them to me here. Not a problem. Which suit? I think the Hugo Boss. The gray with the light pinstripes. A light blue Oxford, and just pick any tie. You know where the key is, right? Same place? Same place. My next words were spoken in a low whisper so Jeanne and Nate could not overhear. Lorna, listen, don't hurry. Don't get here with the suit until at least 12.30. Harry and Shami need the time. Got it. I raised my voice to its normal pitch and said, Okay, I'll probably be back in holding, so just bring it to the courtroom marshal. His name is Nate. Got it. I'm leaving now to go to your place. Thanks. I disconnected and got up. I presented myself to Marshal Nate and said, 
I'd like to wait in holding so I could visit with my client and then change when my fresh suit arrived. I realized as I was taken back into holding that I had not eaten anything and should have asked Lorna to bring me a power bar. The emptiness in my stomach was accentuated by the anxiety I was feeling about what was happening in applied forensics. I knew I was taking my last shot with the gambit I had played over the last two days. It was going to be do or die time very soon. The hearing on the Habis motion did not get back under way until almost two o'clock, thanks to Lorna's delayed in bringing my suit. The judge wasn't too happy about the late start, but I was pleased because I now had everything I needed to face Tiffany Sanger one more time on the witness. Stand. Bosch and Arslanian had come through. Arslanian was outside in the hallway and ready to testify, and Bosch sat in the first row of the gallery, next to the Channel 5 courtroom sketch artist. After Judge Colvo convened court and told me to proceed, I recalled Sergeant Stephanie Sanger to the witness stand. The judge reminded her that she was still under oath. Good to see you again, Sergeant Sanger, I began. I want to start today by asking you about some testimony and evidence that came in last week specifically the cell phone data that was examined by my investigator. Is there a question in there? Sanger asked. Not yet, Sergeant Sanger. But let's start with this one. On the date, Deputy Roberto Sands was murdered on the front lawn of his ex-wife's house. Were you following him? Sanger stared at me with her dagger eyes before answering. Yes, I was, she said. I nodded and jotted a note down on my legal pad. No matter what Maggie McPhears had done to Bosch's credibility on the stand, the data contained irrefutable facts and Sanger was in no position to deny them. But I still was surprised by her straightforward answer to my first question. It knocked me off my game because I was expecting to have to ask several questions before I finally got her to admit that she had followed Roberto Sands. My legal pad was covered with follow-up questions that I no longer needed. It made me jump to an improvised set of questions I should never have asked. You admit that you were following Roberto Sands on the day of his death. Yes, I just did. Why were you following him? Because he asked me to. There it was. With one ill-advised and improvised question, we were off in uncharted territory, and I had no doubt that what would come out would be a concocted story that explained the incontrovertible cell data. I knew that if I didn't bring it out and attempt to control it, Hayden Morris would do that on his recross. I had to handle this right now and then get back to my intended path. Why did Roberto Sands ask you to follow him? I asked. Because he was meeting with an FBI agent and he was worried that he was being set up. Sanger said, he wanted me to watch in case something went wrong and he needed me to come to the rescue. Sanger and the AG were doing exactly what I had been doing throughout the hearing. Taking the negatives and owning them. If it looks bad that you were following the murder victim, then say the murder victim asked you to. There was nobody alive to refute it. He would need you to rescue him from an FBI agent. I asked. Not necessarily in that moment, Sanger said. More like later if someone had to vouch for his story that he had met with the FBI and turned down whatever it was the Bureau wanted. He never told you what the Bureau wanted. He never met the chance. Then how do you know he used the meeting to turn down the FBI? He told me ahead of time that that's what he planned to do. It was a story that didn't make a lot of sense on close inspection. But I knew if I waded into the bog any further, there might be all manner of hidden traps below the murk for me to stumble into. I had already done enough damage by giving Sanger the chance to explain the cell data. I had improvised as best I could in the moment. And you never filed a report on this or told the investigators of Sands's murder about it? I asked. No, I didn't, Sanger said. Sands gets murdered after a clandestine meeting with an FBI agent and you didn't think the homicide investigators would want to know that. I didn't. And why is that? I thought it would taint Robbie Sands's reputation. He was dead, his ex-wife had killed him, and I didn't think it had to be brought up. Once again I had opened an exit for her. I had to find my way out of this bog. All right, let's move on, Surgeon Sanger, I said. Please describe for the court the protocol you followed when you conducted the gunshot trusted be test on Lucinda Sands on the night of her ex-husband's murder. It's pretty simple, really, she said. The stubs come in a package of two, and, let me interrupt you there. Can you explain what you mean by stubs? They are round foam discs with a carbon adhesive that picks up the gunshot residue when wiped over a person's hands and arms. So you opened a package containing two stubs when you tested Lucinda Sands? Correct. Did you wear gloves when you did this? 
Yes, I did. Why is that, Surgeon Sanger? So I would not possibly contaminate the stubs. I carry and handle a weapon, so my hands could have GSR on them. It is standard protocol in the department and all other agencies to wear gloves while conducting a GSR test on a suspect. You are saying that at the time, Lucinda Sands was already a suspect. No, I was talking about general protocol. In the case you are specifically referring to, Ms. Sands was not considered a suspect at that time. We viewed her as a witness, primarily, until we gathered all the facts. Why were you so quick to test her for GSR if she was just a witness? Because, first of all, gunshot residue sheds from the skin. It is best to take a GSR test within two hours of a gun incident. After four hours, it is useless because of shedding. And second, we didn't know what we had out there, so we wanted to cover all the bases. I conducted the test, and it turned out later to be positive. I think I already testified to all of this. That's okay, Surgeon Sanger. We want to make sure we get it right. How did you find out that the test was positive? The late investigator called me to tell me and to thank me for running. The test so early. It was a very solid positive response for GSR, he said. I asked the judge to strike the second half of Sanger's answer as non-responsive to my question, but Colvo overruled me and told me to move on. So he did everything by the book. Isn't that correct, Surgeon Sanger? Correct. You gloved up, opened the testing package, conducted the test, then resealed the stubs in a lab bag. Correct. No contamination. Correct. And you gave that lab bag to Deputy Keith Mitchell to turn over to the homicide investigators, yes? Yes. Morris stood up and objected. Your Honor, counsel has already been over this in his direct examination, he said. Why are we wasting the court's time with this? I was wondering the same thing, Mr. Haller, Colvo said. Judge, my next question should pretty much get us into new territory. I said. Very well, she said, but I'm putting you on a short leash, recede. I looked at my legal pad and composed myself in the next question. Surgeon Sanger, are you familiar with touch DNA? Morris was quickly up on his feet again. Your Honor, sidebar, he said. Colvo signaled us forward with her hand. Come up, she said. Morris and I went to the bench, and the judge leaned forward to hear his objection. Your Honor, counsel is straying into an area of questioning the court. Ruled inadmissible yesterday, Morris said. I don't know if he is trying to set up another outburst followed by a rebuke from the court, but he is obviously heading toward the forbidden zone. Not true to judge, I said quickly. I don't intend to ask this witness. Anything about the lack of Lucinda Sands's DNA on the GSR pad, the court's ruling was crystal clear to me yesterday. I would think that a night in jail would keep you far away from what was ruled out yesterday, Mr. Howler, Colo said. It has, Judge, I said, and you can put me back in the cell if I bring up my client's DNA or lack thereof. Very well, proceed, Colo said, carefully. Objection overruled. We went back to our places and I checked my notes. Again, Surgeon Sanger, aren't you familiar with touch DNA? I asked. I know what it is, Sanger said, but I'm not an expert on it. We have a lab for that. Well, you don't need to be an expert to answer this. How is it, with the protocol you say you followed in collecting GSR from Lucinda Sands, that your own DNA ended up on at least one of the GSR stubs you allegedly swiped on Lucinda Sands' hands and arms? Morris bolted up from his chair as if he had received an electric shock. He spread his arms wide. Your Honor, counsel has done exactly what he just said he would not do, he said. No, I did not, I said quickly. I asked the witness if... Let me stop you there, Colo said. I'll see both of you in chambers right now. Everyone else can take a 15-minute break. She left the bench in a swirl of black robe. Morris and I followed. S-T-I-L-I-N-H-E-R robe. The judge looked at us from behind her desk. Sit, she commanded. Mr. Haller, I find myself losing patience with you once again. I can't believe it's because you find the accommodations at the Metropolitan Detention Center to your liking. No judge, I said. Not at all. Then I don't understand what you're doing, she said. As Mr. Morris has already pointed out, you are walking dangerously close to fire. I ruled. The lab results proffered yesterday inadmissible. And here you are, asking the witness about lab results. I nodded in agreement as she said it. Judge, you ruled that the GSR pads could have been tested for Lucinda Sands' DNA by the defense at the time of the initial prosecution of this case, I said. 
He ruled that it wasn't new evidence brought to light under the requirements of a bias, but rather a misstep by the defense attorney, back then and therefore inadmissible. As I said during the sidebar, I am not going there. Then where are you going? Colo asked. The witness just testified to the protocols she allegedly followed when she tested Lucinda Sands for gunshot residue. She gloved up, opened the testing package, swiped the stubs over Sands, and resealed them in the package. I am prepared to provide the court with evidence that Sergeant Sanger's DNA is on the stub turned over to the defense five years ago and held secure at applied forensics ever since. You did a comparison with her DNA? Yes, Judge. And where did you get her DNA, since this was not a court-ordered, analysis? Sanger is a smoker. Her DNA was taken from a cigarette butt she discarded yesterday after court. My investigator and forensics expert collected it and took it to applied forensics for comparison to the unidentified DNA found on the stuff from the Sands case. Just so we know, this analysis did not require examination of the GSR pad, which is evidence, and would have required an order from you. This was a comparison of DNA from the collected cigarette butt to the unknown DNA profile found during the earlier analysis of the evidence. We got the results just before court convened today. It's Sanger's DNA and I am entitled to ask her how it got there. Morris made a groaning sound that he rolled into an objection. It's just as inadmissible as yesterday, he said. Plus, it's impossible to get a DNA analysis done in less than 24 hours. Not if you're willing to pay, I said. And if your forensics expert is nationally recognized and overseeing the work. Mr. Haller, where do you think you're going with this? The judge asked. Where we have always been going with this case, I said. Lucinda Sands was set up for her ex-husband's murder. The key piece of evidence in this setup was the GSR found on her hands. Not only did it indicate that she had fired a gun, but it appeared to catch her in a lie, and from there the investigators never looked at anybody else. It is the petitioner's theory and belief that at some point after Sanger swabbed Sands and before Mitchell, handed the evidence to the homicide investigators, the pads, or stubs, were replaced with pads dirty with GSR. So judge, you want to know where I'm going? I'm going right at Sanger. I want to know how her DNA ended up on that pad. Cole was silent as she tracked my argument. I took the time to pile on before Morris could. This is new evidence to judge, I said. It's not something the original defense could have come up with because Sanger's name is not even in the police reports. Now we kicked out the crime recreation and the DNA from yesterday, but together these things make clear what happened. Stephanie Sanger now even admits to seeing Roberto Sands meeting with an FBI agent but not reporting it to the investigation. Why? Because she's the one who killed Sands and set up his ex-wife to take the fall. The judge continued to stare at me without really seeing me. She was going through the steps checking the logic of my theory. Morris had apparently already dismissed it, probably because it had come from a defense attorney and he was trained never to agree with one. This is fantasy, he said. Your Honor, you can't possibly be considering this as valid. It's smoke and mirrors, exactly what Mr. Hallard is known for. Colho stopped analyzing and looked at me. Is that what you are known for, Mr. Hallard? She asked, smoke and mirrors? Uh, I hope it's for more than that, Judge and I said. She nodded, her expression unreadable. But then she said the magic words I've been waiting for. I'm going to allow it, she said. Mr. Haller, you can ask your questions, and we'll see where it goes. Your Honor, I have to object, Morris said. This is pure. Mr. Morris, you already objected, and I just overruled the objection. Colo said. Is that not clear to you? Yes, Judge, he said weakly. Thank you, Your Honor, I said. With her ruling, she was now redeemed in my eyes. The judge stayed behind when we left her chambers. I followed Morris back to the courtroom. He was silent the whole way, walking fast, as if to get away from me. Cat got your tongue, Morris, I said, or is it the weight of knowing you're on the wrong side of this one? He didn't respond other than to hold up a fist, the middle finger extended. He went through the door to the courtroom and didn't bother to hold it open for me. Nice guy, I said. In the courtroom I saw that the spot where Bosch had been sitting was empty. I headed out to the hall, hoping to find him in Arslanian before the judge took the bench and convened the hearing again. I found Shami on a bench next to the courtroom door, but there was no sign of Bosch. The judge is going to allow Sanger's DNA, I said. You will have to testify about the cigarette butt, 
the collection of it and everything else. Mickey, that's great, Arslanian said. I'm ready. Where's Harry? We may need him if the judge wants to see his photos of the cigarette. When Sanger left the courtroom, he followed her out. He told me he wanted to keep an eye on her in case she made a run for it. Seriously. Cop instincts, I guess. I had never doubted Bosch cop instincts. Arslanian's answer gave me pause as I thought about how I would continue the case if Sanger was in the wind. Bosch wanted to get closer so he could hear their conversation, but he couldn't risk it. He was obviously known to Sanger and he had seen the man in the back row of the courtroom. If either saw Bosch it would more than likely shut down what looked like a heated conversation. So Bosch watched from afar, using a bus stop shelter in front of the courthouse on Spring Street as a blind. Sanger and the man she was talking to were in a designated smoking area on the north side of the courthouse. She stood next to a concrete urn that served as a trash can size ashtray. Sanger was smoking, but the man she was talking to was not. He appeared to Bosch to be Latino. He was short with brown skin, jet black hair, and a mustache that extended beyond the corners of his mouth. Their conversation seemed confrontational. The man was dressed completely in black, like a priest, and he leaned slightly toward Sanger as he spoke. And Sanger leaned toward him, shaking her head emphatically as if she disagreed with whatever the man was saying. Bosch checked his watch. The courtroom break was almost over and he needed at least five minutes to go back in through security and take an elevator. When he looked back at the smoking section, he saw the man lean and even closer to Sanger and grab the front of her uniform with one hand. It happened so quickly that there was almost no struggle from Sanger. With his free hand, the man pulled Sanger's weapon from her holster, pressed the muzzle to her side, and fired three quick shots, using her body to muffle the reports. He then pushed her into the urn and she toppled over it to the ground. A woman passing on the sidewalk screamed and started running, away from the courthouse. The man with the gun didn't even look up. He stepped around the urn, extended his arm, and fired one more time, finishing Sanger with a headshot. He turned and walked calmly out of the smoking area. He crossed the front steps of the courthouse, moved quickly out to the sidewalk, and headed south on Spring Street. He carried the gun down at his side. Bosch stepped out of the bus shelter and ran up the steps and into the smoking area. Sanger was dead, her eyes open and staring blankly at the sky. The final bullet hit her in the exact center of her forehead. Blood soaked her uniform in the concrete next to her body. Bosch turned. The killer was now a block away on spring. A uniformed marshal had stepped through the heavy glass doors of the courthouse after hearing the shots and the pedestrians scream. Bosch moved toward him. A deputy's been shot, he said. That guy walking down spring is the shooter. Bosch pointed toward the man in black. Where's the deputy? The marshal asked. In the smoking area, Bosch said. She's dead. The marshal ran off toward the smoking area as he pulled a radio from a holster on his belt and yelled in the call. Shots fired, officer down. North side smoking area. Repeat, shots fired, officer down. Bosch looked down Spring Street. The killer had passed the city hall and was almost to First Street. He was getting away. Bosch started down Spring Street in pursuit. He pulled his phone and called 911. An operator answered immediately. This is 911. What is your emergency? There's been a shooting outside the federal courthouse. A man killed a sheriff's deputy with her own gun. I'm following him south on Spring Street. I'm unarmed. Okay, sir, slow down. Who got shot? You said a deputy? Yes, a sheriff's deputy. Sergeant Stephanie Sanger. The federal marshals are there and I'm following the shooter. I need backup to Spring and First Street. He's literally walking by the PM right now. The police administration building was on the east side of Spring. As Bosch followed, he saw the killer cross over to the west side of the street and continue walking beside the old Los Angeles Times building toward 2nd Street. As he'd crossed the street, he had glanced back up Spring as if looking for cars, but Bosch knew he was checking to see if he was being followed. Bosch was more than a block away, did not attract the gunman's attention. I think he's going to turn west on 2nd, he said. Sir, are you law enforcement? The operator asked. Retired LAPD. Then you need to stop and wait for the police officers to arrive. They have been dispatched. I can't. He's hitting away. Sir, do you need? I was wrong. He didn't turn on second. He's still on spring, heading south toward third. Sir, listen to me. You need to stop what you're doing and... 
Bosch disconnected and put the phone in his pocket. He knew he needed to pick up speed if he was going to keep the gunman in sight. He got to the corner of Spring and Second, just as the gunman reached Third Street and turned the corner out of sight. Bosch started to run and cross to the west side when there was an opening in traffic. At Third, Bosch turned right and saw the gunman halfway up the block to Broadway. He had crossed over to the south side of the street. Bosch stayed on the sidewalk on the north side, slowed his pace, and tried to regulate his breathing. Third Street ran slightly uphill, and Bosch started huffing. The adrenaline flood that had hit his bloodstream when he saw Sanger murdered in broad daylight was starting to ebb. The gunman crossed Broadway against the traffic light and turned left on the other side. By the time Bosch got to the corner, the light had changed and the walk signal was flashing. Bosch crossed and watched as the gunman ducked into the Grand Central Market. Bosch could hear sirens now, but they weren't close. His guess was that the officers he had asked for had responded to the shooting scene rather than to the location he had given the 911 operator. The market was crowded with people buying groceries or in line to order from the many different food stalls. Bosch entered and at first did not see the man in black. Then he appeared on the stairs at the midway point of the split-level market. At the top of the stairs, he looked back but did not focus on Bosch and the sea of shoppers. Bosch guessed that he was looking for uniforms, not an old man in a suit. Bosch noted that the man was no longer carrying the gun in his hand, but his shirt was now out of his pants. That told Bosch he had not ditched the gun. It was tucked into his pants under his shirt. The gunman went through the block long market, emerged on Hill Street, and without hesitation waded out into traffic and crossed the road. Bosch came out of the market in time to see the man go through the turnstile at Angel Slight and climb into the waiting train car. Bosch knew he had to hold back. He could not get into the train car without exposing himself to the killer. He stayed across the street and watched as the door closed and the car started to move slowly up the tracks or the terminus at the top of Bunker Hill. Angel's Flight was a funicular that was billed as the shortest train rub in the world. It had twin antique rail cars that went up and down 150 feet of elevated track. They were counterbalanced with one going up while the other came down, passing each other at the midpoint of the tracks. Bosch crossed Hill Street as the second car arrived at the lower turnstile. He got on along with a handful of other passengers and sat on one of the wooden bench seats. He waited anxiously as the train car rumbled up the tracks. At the top of the tracks was a plaza surrounded by the towering glass buildings of the financial district. Bosch had moved to the upper door of the train car so he could be the first one off when it reached its terminus. The Angel's Flight ticket booth was there, and he had to pay a dollar before he could get through the upper turnstile. He pulled his money out and saw that the smallest bill he had was a twenty. He pushed it through the opening in the booth's glass. Keep the change, he said, just let me through. He went through the turnstile, and once out in the open plaza did a three hundred and sixty. Degree sweep with his eyes but did not spot the man in black. Bosch saw an opening between one of the towers and the contemporary art museum to his right. He headed that way, breaking into a trot. When he reached Grand Avenue, he did another 360, but there was still no sign of the man in black. He was gone. Shit, he said. He was panting. He bent over and put his hands on his knees so he could catch his breath. He was sweating badly. You okay, sir? Bosch looked up. It was a woman carrying a bag from the museum store. Yes, I'm fine, he said, just a little winded. But thanks. She's dead. Somebody shot her with her own gun when she was on the smoking patty rot side. Oh, shit. I followed him, but I lost him on Bunker Hill. You saw it happen. From a distance. I'll need to talk to the police and give them what I know. Absolutely. What happens now? With the case. I have no clue. I'd assume the judge will adjourn for the day. This is unbelievable. She moved on and Bosch straightened up and scanned the street a final time in both directions, once more looking for the man in black. Nothing caught his attention. No pedestrian, no car. The gunman could have gone a dozen different ways after getting off Angel's flight. Bosch's phone buzzed and he saw that it was Havler calling. Mick. Harry, where the fuck are you? I need you back here. Something's going on. The clerk got a call and Sanger's dead. What? Did she kick out the DNA again? No, it's in. She ruled for us. But I don't know what will happen without Sanger. Bosch realized that Haller would not have been allowed to use his phone in the courtroom. Where are you? He asked. The hall outside the courtroom, 
Haller said. The judge sent me out to find you and Sanger. Who was the shooter? I don't know, but he was in the courtroom today. Back row. I saw him. A Latino guy? Yeah. I saw him too. I don't remember him from previous days. I don't either. I'm heading back, but I'll probably be tied up with the police for a while. Got it. I'll go see what the judge wants to do. Bosch disconnected and walked north on Grand, turned right on first, and headed to the Civic Center. He was thankful it was downhill most of the way. By the time he got back to the federal courthouse, the entire Spring Street side of the building was cordoned off with crime scene tape, and the area was overrun with officers from the LAPD, the Sheriff's Department, and the U.S. Marshals Service. Bosch walked up to an LAPD officer standing at the yellow tape. His name tag said F-R-N-C-H. The courthouse is closed, sir, French said. I'm a witness, Bosch said. Who I talked to? A witness to what? To the deputy getting shot. I followed the shooter but lost him. The officer suddenly looked alert. All right, you need to stay here. Fine. Officer French took a step back and started talking into his radio. As Bosch waited, he saw a van from Channel 5 pull to the curb. A woman with perfectly coy hair jumped out of the passenger side with a microphone already in her hand. Late Friday night I was summoned to Judge Colho's courtroom. It had been three days since she had adjourned the Habeas hearing in the wake of Stephanie Sanger's murder. I had spent most of that time watching and reading news reports on the killing, waiting for the media to connect the dots. Finally, there was a story this morning in the Times by their veteran crime reporter James Quilly that delved deeply into Sanger's background and activities, and most likely that had prompted the summons from the judge. Quilly reported that Sanger was a member of a sheriff's clique called Los Cucos and that investigators of her murder had found connections between her and a Mexican cartel that had compromised her and forced her to do its bidding, which may have included a series of contract killings of cartel rivals in California. The story also detailed the Roberto Sanz case from his murder to his ex-wife's current bid to be exonerated. The Times report was the first to reveal that Sanger had been testifying in that habeas case just minutes before she was killed outside the courthouse. Unnamed sources told the newspaper that the working theory of the investigation was that Sanger had been killed to prevent her from testifying, further, and being pushed to cooperate with authorities. I had talked to Quilly off the record, telling him both what I knew as fact and what I believed. Without naming Agent Messisic, I reported what Miss Isaac had told me at my house earlier in the week, that on the day of his murder, Roberto Sanz had informed the FBI agent that Sanger and other deputies in the Cucos were controlled by members of the Sinaloa Cardinal operating in Los Angeles. I also told Quilly my own working theory. Based on the fact that she had followed Roberto Sanz and had seen him with the FBI, that Sanger had killed him. The reporter had taken it from there, confirming the facts and ferreting out new ones, and the story was on the front page above the fold of the print edition and was the lead in the newspaper's digital edition. When I went to Colvo's courtroom, Morris was already there waiting. He did not acknowledge me. He sat stone silent at the state's table, not even responding when I casually said hello to him as well as to the court's clerk and the stenographer Millie. Jit Brown called the judge in chambers to say all parties were present, and she told him to send us back to her along with the stenographer. We went silently. Morris looked like he'd experienced a couple of sleepless nights. The judge's robe was on a hanger on the back of the door to her chambers. She was dressed in black pants and a white blouse. Gentlemen, thank you for coming, she said. Let Millie get set up, and then I'd like to go on the record in the Sands matter. Should Lucinda be here? I asked. I don't think it's necessary for this meeting, Colo said, but I did tell the marshals to bring her over from NDC for the afternoon session. That told me that the case wasn't over, yet. We sat silently as the stenographer moved into the corner behind the judge's desk sat on a padded stool already there and poised her fingers over her steno machine. Okay, on the record again with Sands versus the state of California. Colo said, Mr. Haller, where are you with the presentation of your case? I'd known she would ask this question and was prepared for it. Your Honor, in light of what has transpired and the fact that I can't continue with Sergeant Sanger as a witness, I'm prepared to rest my case and proceed with final arguments. If final arguments are even necessary, Cole nodded, having expected that answer. Mr. Morris, she said. The prosecutor seemed to sense that the case was on the line. His tone was defensive from the start. The state is ready to proceed, Your Honor, Morris said. 
We have witnesses, including a witness who will testify that Lucinda Sands confessed to her that she killed her husband. I smiled and shook my head. You can't be serious, I said. Your witness is a little leaky, Hayden. She's a convicted killer who concocted this confession from newspaper stories she had her brother pull from the library downtown and read to her over the phone. I could tell that the brother was new information to Morris and that he was realizing that his team had failed to properly vet the witness. One day, I went on. That's all it took to find the brother. I was going to destroy your witness on the stand. But it doesn't matter now. Have you read the paper today? Sandra was a killer, and she killed Roberto Sands. There is no doubt about that, and my investigator witnessed her murder. She was arguing with a guy she obviously knew. She let him get close enough to grab her gun. Bosch spent an entire night with the cops, the DEA, and everybody else, looking at mugshots. The guy he identified as the shooter is a Sicario for the Sinaloa cartel. A hit man. Morris shook his head as if to ward off the truth. He'd gone back to his case mantra. Lucinda pleaded no contest to killing her ex-husband. Innocent people didn't do that. She had no choice, I said. That's what this is about. She got railroaded. She had a bad lawyer, and the key piece of evidence against her was manufactured by Sanger. We were in the middle of proving that when Sanger was put down. Morris looked at the judge, ignoring me. Judge, we are entitled to present our case, he said. He got to present his. Now we present ours. You're not entitled to anything, Mr. Morris Colo said. Not in my courtroom. Not until I tell you what you are entitled to. Apologies, Your Honor, Morris said. I misspoke. What I meant was... I don't need to hear it, the judge said, cutting Morris off. I'm prepared to rule on the petition. I just wanted to give you gentlemen a heads up. At two o'clock, we will convene in the courtroom, and I will announce my decision. That will be all for now. You may go. You can't do this, Morris said. The state strenuously objects to the court's rendering of a decision before the state has presented its case. Mr. Morris, if the state disagrees with my ruling, it can take the matter up on appeal. Kulho said, But I think your appellate branch will look at the case closely and decide not to embarrass itself. We are adjourned and off the record now. I will see you both in the courtroom at two. In the meantime, go have a nice lunch. Thank you, Your Honor, I said. I stood up. Morris looked paralyzed. He seemed unable to get up from his chair. Mr. Morris, are you leaving? Cole asked. Oh, yes, I'm leaving, Morris said. He rocked back, then forward, using the momentum to launch himself out of the chair. This time I led the way back to the courtroom, and when I got to the door, I opened it wide for Morris to go through first. After you, I said. Fuck you, he said. I nodded. I had seen that coming. In the courtroom I checked the time and saw that I had a solid two hours before the hearing resumed and Colvo gave the ruling that I believed would end the case. Still, I didn't think there was enough time for me to get over to NDC to prep Lucinda before they started procedures to move her to the courthouse. I texted Bosch and told him to pick me up out front. I took the elevator down and saw Bosch and the navigator when I stepped through the heavy lobby doors. I glanced along the front of the building to the designated smoking section on the north side. It was still ticked off and I wondered whether the tape had just been forgotten or if there was still an on-scene investigation at the spot where Sanger was killed. I opened the front door of the navigator and jumped in. Harry, we just climbed El Cap, I said. Let's go eat. Where? Bosch said. And what's that mean? I told you about climbing El Cap. The judge is going to rule on the bees this afternoon and she's going to rule for us. Let's go over to Nick and Steph's and get steak for lunch. I always eat steak when I win. How are you sure it's a win? The judge told you this? Not in so many words, but I feel it. My courtroom barometer tells me this is over. And Lucinda is going to walk. Depends. The judge could vacate the conviction and set her free. But she could also send the case back to the district attorney's office and let them decide whether or not to take her to trial. If that happens, she could keep Lucinda incarcerated until the choice is made or until the AG's office decides if they're going to appeal. We'll know for sure it too. Bosch whistled as he pulled the navigator away from the curb. And all because you pulled a needle out of a haystack, I said. Amazing. We make a good team, Harry. Yeah, well, come on, man. Don't rain on the parade. No rain, but I'll wait till it's official. I don't have a courtroom barometer. 
I gotta call Shami. She'll want to be in court for this. What about Silver? Second place Silver can read about it in the news. I'm not doing him any favors. He costs Lucinda five years of her life. Bosch nodded in agreement. Fuck him, he said. Fuck him, I repeated. What about her kid? Bosch asked. Should we get into court? Yes, good idea, I said. I'll call Muriel at lunch, see if they can come down. I'll need her to bring some clothes for Lucinda, just in case. As Bosch drove to the restaurant, I worked my phone, texting news about the two o'clock hearing to James Quilly, Britta Shude, and all the other reporters I knew. I wanted everybody there. The courtroom was packed by two o'clock. In the first two rows of the gallery, members of the media were sitting shoulder to shoulder. The Sanger killing and the mystery surrounding it was the biggest story going at the moment, and thanks to the Times article, it was clear that the nexus of the case was courtroom three in the U.S. District Courthouse. The two rows behind the media contained several members of Lucinda, Sanz's family, including her mother, son, and brother, as well as a variety of citizen observers, defense attorneys, and prosecutors who knew this courtroom was the place to be. In the last row, all the way in the back corner, sat Maggie Nefersen with our daughter Haley. I was happy to see my daughter, but puzzled by my ex-wife's decision to be there, especially after her efforts against my client's cause. There was a palpable sense of momentousness in the air. The feeling that something unusual, maybe even extraordinary, was going to happen ramped. Up another notch when Lucinda was brought through the door from holding, for the first time, not in MDC Blues. Her mother had brought clothes for her and I got them to her in holding in time for her to change before the hearing. She wore a light blue Mexican house dress with short sleeves and flowers embroidered along the hem. Her hair was not in a tight ponytail but down and framing her face. A hush fell over the gallery as Marshall Mate escorted her to our table and cuffed her to the ring. Hopefully for the last time. You look great, I whispered. I think it's going to be a good day. Your son and mother and other family members are here to see it. Is it okay for me to turn and look? She asked. Of course it is. They're here for you. Okay. She turned and looked back into the gallery and tears immediately came to her eyes. She clasped her free hand into a fist and held it to her chest. I don't know if I had ever been more moved by something I saw in a courtroom. When Lucinda turned to the front to hide her tears from her family, I put my arm around her shoulders and leaned in close to whisper. You've got a lot of love behind you. I know that. They never gave up on me. They knew the truth, and they're going to hear it said today. I hope so. I know so. The silence from the gallery seemed to increase the tension in the room, and it doubled when two o'clock came and went without the judge, emerging from chambers. The minutes ticked by like hours. Finally, at 2.25, Marshall Maid gave the order to rise as the judge took the bench. Koho carried a thin file and seemed to be all business from the start. Please be seated, she said. We are back on the record with Sands versus the state of California. It looks like we have a full house today. I want it known that the court will not tolerate any outbursts or demonstrations of any sort from those in the gallery as we proceed. This is a court of law and I expect decorum and respect from all those who come through these doors. She paused and scanned the gallery as if looking for dissenters. I saw her eyes hold for a moment when she reached the area where Maggie McPherson was sitting. Her focus then moved on and with no challenges to her authority, Koba finally brought her eyes down to me and then over to Morris. She asked if there was any new business before she proceeded to issue her ruling on the Nabis petition. Morris stood up. Yes, Your Honor, he said, the state of California, representing the people of California, renew our objection to the court's decision to leapfrog. The state's case in this matter? I stood up and was ready to argue the point if needed. Leapfrog, the judge said. An interesting choice of words, Mr. Morris. But as I said earlier in Chambers, the state's remedy here is to appeal the rulings of this court. Then the state asks that this hearing be continued until there is an appellate ruling, Morris said. Not happening, Mr. Morris, Colo said. You file your appeal, but I am ready and I am going to rule today. Anything else? No, Your Honor, Morris said. No, Your Honor, I said. Very well, Colo said. She opened the file she had brought with her, put on a pair of glasses, and began to read her decision aloud. I looked over at Lucinda sitting next to me and nodded. The writ of a beast corpus is a fundamental pillar of our justice system. Colo said, 
Chief Justice John Marshall wrote nearly 200 years ago that habeas corpus is the sacred means of allowing for the liberation of those who may be imprisoned without sufficient cause. It safeguards our freedom, protects us from the arbitrary and lawless actions of the state. It is my job today to decide if the state made a lawless action in imprisoning Lucinda Sands for the murder of Roberto Sands. The question is complicated by the fact that the petitioner, Ms. Sands, pleaded no contest to a charge of manslaughter. After carefully reviewing the evidence and testimony presented during this hearing and considering what happened outside court this week, the court holds that the petitioner saw the plea agreement she was offered as the only light at the end of a dark tunnel. Whether she was coerced by her attorney at the time, not you, Mr. Howler, or concluded on her own that she had no choice but to accept a plea agreement does not matter to this court. What does matter is the clear mandate of the Constitution and Bill of Rights that habeas relief be granted when the state court's determination of a case is an unreasonable application of the law. This court finds that the petitioner has established that by producing clear and new evidence of the manufacturing of evidence against the petitioner. I made a fist and turned and whispered to Lucinda. You're going home. What about a trial? Not when there's manufactured evidence. This is over. Because I was turned toward Lucinda, I didn't see more a stand object. Your Honor, he said. Colville looked up from the document she was reading. Mr. Morris, you know better than to interrupt me, she said. You will sit down. I know what your objection is and you are overruled. Sit down. Now. Morris dropped down into his seat like a bag of dirty laundry. Continuing, Colo said, as I expect no further interruptions. She looked down, and it took her a moment to find the spot where she had left off. The actions of the sheriff's department, particularly those taken by the late Sergeant Sanger, so damaged the integrity of the investigation and subsequent prosecution as to permanently embed with reasonable doubt. Therefore, the ruling of this court is to grant a beast relief to the petitioner. The conviction of Lucinda Sands is vacated. The judge closed the file and took off her glasses. The courtroom remained silent. She looked directly at Lucinda. Miss Sands, you are no longer convicted of this crime. Your freedom and civil rights are restored. I can only offer you the apology of this court for the five years you have lost. Godspeed to you. You are free to go, and this court is now adjourned. It seemed that it wasn't until the judge had gone through the door and left the courtroom that everybody remaining took a breath. But then the sound of excited voices exploded in the room. Lucinda turned and hugged me, throwing her free arm around my neck. Mickey, I thank you so much, she said, her tears smearing my freshly dry clean canal suit. I can't believe this. I really can't. While she held me, Marshall Nate came to the table and unlocked her wrist. He started to remove the cuff. Can she leave from here? I asked, or does she have to go through the MDC? No, the judge said her free man. Marshal Maid said, she's free to go. Unless she left property behind at the jail and was to get it. Lucinda turned from my chest to look up at Marshal Maid. No, nothing, she said, and thank you for being kind to me. Not a problem, Marshal Maid said, good luck to you. He turned and walked back to his desk by the holding cell's door. Lucinda, you heard him, I said, you're free. Why don't you go see your family now? She looked over my shoulder at her family waiting in the gallery, her son with her mother, brother, and several cousins. To a person, they had tears running down their faces, even those whose clothing couldn't hide the tattoos, affirming their allegiance to white fence. I can just go, she asked. You can just go, I said, if you want to talk to the media after you see your son and everybody. I'll tell them they can find you outside the courthouse where they can set up cameras. You think I should? Yes, I think you should. Tell them what you've been through these last five and a half years. Okay, Mickey, but first my family? I nodded. She got up, walked through the gate into the gallery, and was soon being hugged by her son and all of her family members at once. I took it all in for a long moment, and then I heard my name called from the front row. It was Queely. I walked over to the rail, and the reporters squeezed together to hear me. For those of you who need film, my client and I will hold a press, Conference outside the courthouse on the Spring Street side. Bring your cameras and questions and I'll see you there. I turned to look at the AG's table and saw that Morris was already gone. He had probably slipped out while Lucinda and I hugged and celebrated our victory and his loss. When I looked at the back of the courtroom, I saw my daughter and ex-wife still seated in the last row. I walked through the gate, went down the center aisle, 
and slipped into the now empty row in front of them. Congratulations, Dad, Haley said. That was amazing. I call it the resurrection walk, I said. You don't get too many of them. Thanks for coming, Hay. I would have missed it if Mom hadn't called me, she said. I looked at Maggie, unsure how to proceed. Luckily, she took the lead. Congratulations, she said. I obviously was on the wrong side of this one. Please apologize to Harry for me. Well, he's around here somewhere, I said. Maybe you could say that to his face. Apologize for what? Haley asked. I'll tell you in the car, Maggie said. I nodded that that was okay with me. Now what? Maggie asked. Are you going to sue the county for millions? If my client wants me to, I'll have to talk to her. Come on, you know you're going to sue and you're going to win. There was an edge to her voice. She still had to bust on me even though I had won the day. I let it go. Maggie didn't have the same hold over me she'd once had. I had reached the point where her disappointments in me no longer mattered. We'll see, I said. It helps when the other side has manufactured evidence. Haley pointed behind me and I turned to see Jim Brown standing at the railing. The judge would like to see you in chambers, he said. Right now, I asked. He nodded and I realized it had been a dumb question. I'll be right there. I turned back to my daughter. Can you come out tonight and celebrate with me? I asked. Sure, she said. Where are you going to go? I don't know. Dantana's Musso's Matza. You pick. No, you pick. Just text me where and when. I looked at Maggie. You can come too, you know, I said. I think you should celebrate with your daughter, she said. Have a great time. You earned it. I nodded. Well, I guess I should go see what the judge wants, I said. Don't keep her waiting, Maggie said. I walked down the road to the center aisle and got there just as Bosch came through the door from the hall. Were you here? I asked. We won. Lucinda's free. I saw it, he said. I was standing in the back. Where is Shami? Did she see it? She was here, but she went back to the hotel. She's going to try to get a red eye back to New York tonight. I'll take her to the airport. A sudden involuntary need took over and I reached out and hugged him. He stiffened but didn't pull away. We did it, Harry, I said. We did it. You did it, he said. No, it takes a team, I said. And an innocent client. We awkwardly disengaged and both looked at Lucinda, still surrounded by family, her once manacled hand grasping her son's. That's a beautiful thing, Bosch said. It is, I said. We watched silently for a moment and then I saw Jin standing and staring at me from his coral. I nodded to him. I was coming. I got to see the judge, but two things, Harry, I said. As soon as I'm finished with her, we're going to have a press conference outside on the Spring Street side. I know it's not your thing, but I would like you there if you want to be there. And the second, he asked. Dinner tonight, to celebrate? Haley's coming. Bring Maddie if you want. That's something I'm up for. I'll check with Maddie. Where? When? I'll text you. I started walking toward the railing. Hope to see you downstairs, I said. You deserve to be there. Call, shot me and see if she'll come back for the press conference. And for dinner. We'll get her to the airport afterward. I'll call her. I left him there, went through the gate, and crossed the proving ground to go see the judge. The door to her chambers was open, but I reached in and knocked anyway. She was behind the desk, no longer wearing the black robe. Come in, Mr. Haller, she said. Have a seat. I did as she instructed. She was writing on a legal pad and I said nothing to interrupt. She finally put her pen into the holder of an ornate desk set with her name engraved on a brass plaque and looked up at me. Congratulations, she said. I believe the petitioner in this case had a formidable advocate at her side. I smiled. Thank you, Your Honor, I said. And thank you for cutting through all the distractions and smoke screens to get to an incisive and just ruling. You know, I rarely venture into federal court because, well, it's kind of David versus a bunch of Goliaths most of the time, but after this X. I know what you did, Mr. Haller, she said. I paused. Her tone had grown too serious for a post-hearing meeting between a judge and attorney. What I did, Your Honor, I tried. I took the long lunch to review everything that was presented before I made my determination, she said. That included my prior rulings and actions, and I realized what you'd done in my courtroom. I shook my head. Well, Judge, I said, I think you're going to have to share it with me, because I don't really. 
You intentionally drew me into holding you in contempt. Kuo said. Judge, I don't know what. You needed time to conduct your DNA tests before continuing the case. Don't sit there and deny it. I looked down at my hands and spoke without looking at her. A judge, I think I'm going to take the fifth on that. She said nothing. I looked back up at her. I should file a complaint with the California Bar for conduct. I'm becoming an attorney, she said. But that could significantly damage both your record and your reputation. As I said, you are a formidable advocate, and we need more of them in the justice system. I started to breathe easier. She wanted to scare me, not destroy me. But your actions cannot go by without any consequences, she continued. I'm holding you in contempt, Mr. Haller. Again, I hope you have a toothbrush in your briefcase. You're going to spend another night at MDC. She picked up the desk phone and pushed one number. Anujin was on the other end of that call. Please send Marshal Nate back, she said. She hung up the phone. Judge, isn't there a fine I could pay, I said. A donation to the court's favorite charity or... No, there's not, she said. Marshal Nate entered the room. Nate, please take Mr. Haller to holding, Kolo said. He'll be spending the night at NDC. Nate looked puzzled and didn't move. He's being held in contempt, the judge explained. Nate moved forward and grabbed me by the arm. Let's go, he said. I TWS a long night marked by a fellow inmate's incessant howling. There was no rhyme or reason to it, just a repeated announcement of mental illness. Since sleep was not an option, I spent the time in the dark of my solo cell sitting on its thin mattress, my back to the concrete wall, toilet paper stuffed in my ears, thinking about prior moves and next moves in my life and work. The Lucinda Sands case felt like some sort of pivot to me, as though it might be time to move in a new direction. Chasing cases to feed the machine, grab headlines, and pay for billboards and bus benches. I could not see it being my final destination. I could no longer see it as even valid. But a pivot to what? My long night of discontent ended an hour before dawn when my breakfast was delivered, an apple and a bologna on white bread sandwich. I hadn't eaten since lunch with Bosch the day before, and the jail breakfast tasted as good as anything I'd ever had at Dupar's or the Four Seasons. The cell had a three-inch wide escape-proof window. Soon after morning, light started to filter in through the glass. A detention officer opened the door of my cell, dropped a bag containing my suit on the floor, and told me to get dressed. I was being released. There were men and women in this place who had been held for weeks or months, but my 16 hours of sleep deprivation and isolation were enough for me. This time they changed me. Something had started with Giorgio Otello and reached a crescendo of Lucinda Sands. It was a need to change. At the release unit, I was handed a Ziploc bag containing my wallet, watch, and phone. I looked at these things and wondered if I needed them anymore. A few moments later, I stepped out through a steel door into the sun and began my own resurrection walk. 